of analytics uh, about how to design a gamified survey. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to Survey Analytics for having me here to do this. Um, and also want to say thank you to um, lots of organisations that have um, retweeted and tweeted and put things on LinkedIn about this webinar in order to get us the, the 600 plus registrations that, that we've had. Um, also want to um, say thank you to NewMR all um, who have also helped to promote this event um, serve analytics and my company research for gaming we are both um, sponsors of new MR all, all um, events and webinars and they have a, a wonderful series of webinars as well and I know they've got some great uh, ones coming up for May so check out new .org as well if you're the kind of people that um, you know uh, like to listen into webinars um, from, from thought leaders all around the world so new .org is really good for that um, right, so I'll just uh, get cracking. Obviously, Gina uh, gave a little bit of background about me and, and, and what I do. So um, I am a research game designer. So this is a, a different kind of um, game-based methodology, if you like. So um, a, a research game and a gamified survey, so to my mind, are two very different um, platforms. They've got different procedures, different design processes. So what I'm going to be going through today is to allow you to understand what are those differences and also what is surveytainment? talk to you about some best practices, give you some examples of research on research that has, has come about already. So this webinar that I'm going to be doing with you now is a seven step instruction of how to decide uh, design a gamified survey. Um, so first things first, so the first step obviously in designing a gamified survey is understanding, understanding the different ways that you can use game mechanics and game components to increase engagement with participants of all age groups. Um, so you've got a research game, um, you know, something that very much looks and feels like a game. And I like to, um, you know, say that that's pretty much the kind of hook control of game based methodologies. Um, when I'm designing research, games more often they're not they are made to measure they are very tailor-made to the to the um, brands that I'm, I'm uh, working with and you know the, the, there's quite a heavy narrative going on throughout the research game um, th there might even be music and sound effects going on so for the participant it really uh, allows their sense of disbelief to be suspended in order to become uh, immersed in this experience of a game much like traditional games um, then you've got gamification, you've got gamified surveys. And I like to say that this is more of the off-the-peg approach, if you like. So, you know, if research games are your main to measure, uh, the gamified surveys are things that, you know, um, you know the kind of high street uh, version, if you like, um, where you can have uh, lots of different tools that you can use to make those um, surveys more interesting. So you might use badges, you might use point systems, you might break down the survey that's online into different levels, for example. So even though it might not necessarily be immersive as a game or include a narrative or even some game components like avatars or music, there's still the game mechanics there. And it, it, it's obviously much more of a game the five version of a traditional survey. Um, and then finally, you've got surveytainment. And um, a, a, a term that I heard from John Paulston at GMI Interactive not so long ago was the word deborification. Um, and, and I think that the surveytainment and deborification go hand in hand. And that's kind of the, the embellishment of a survey. Um, so if you can imagine a traditional survey, well, how can I just make this more entertaining without the use of game mechanics? It might be that you are using more scale sliders, drag and drop functions. It might be that instead of text structure, using more imagery as well. Um, and, you know, and doing these things to make the survey much more interactive and basically much more in line with you know other other websites on the on the internet today that people are used to using um so those are three obviously very different approaches to game-based research where obviously survey survey attainment doesn't use game mechanics so um you know it's good to go through well what what makes a game a game and what is gamification so um a game um, at the very basic level, you know, games that you might have played as a child, like hide and seek, to games that you might play now, like Call of Duty or the Candy Crush Saga, all games have rules, a feedback system, a voluntary participation, and a goal. Um, and the voluntary participation element is um, obviously a little bit tricky because in market research, 
we tend to incentivize participants. So their, um, their participation in our surveys is voluntary, but of course we're, we're having to uh, bribe them in some fashion to get them to do our surveys. Obviously in the gaming industry, uh, there's a completely different approach where people enjoy playing games so much that they will obviously give up their hard earned money and their time to play games. So if, if, if games are um, a cake, we'll just use that metaphor for the moment, rather, as you can see here, the rules, the feedback system, the voluntary participation and the goals, they are the core ingredients. And then the icing on top of the cake, is, if you like, is what I call cabin. So um, some more entertaining games, certainly some more addictive games um, have a collaborative approach, an ability to share some kind of communication. So it might be an ability to share your achievements, it might be the ability to share even some trash talk, um, who knows, but there's, uh, there's definitely an ability to share uh, with other players um, in, in a game um, community, for example. Uh, games can also have bonus features and I um, often like to use Farmville as a great example of bonus features and um, an ability to share. So I've just got some screenshots here. So um, I was very much a Farmville addict for a while. I had to um, kind of wean myself off it so I could um, actually get back to do some work. Um, and you, you've got an example here uh, that you can see on the screenshots. Uh, screenshot. So I've um, you know been looking after my sheep. I found a wool bundle and I can share that with my friends for free. And when I share that, I can share that with my Farmville friends who are also my Facebook friends. Um, and going back to the bonus features, another great example of that, and I'll take you back to Farmville again, is the things that Farmville will do um, over you know, any kind of festive holidays and, and special occasions. So, you know, you'll have your farm throughout the year, for example, but you know, around Christmas time, you might be able to purchase a snow blanket, reindeer for your farm, snowmen, evergreen you know, Christmas trees and candy and things like that. Um, and while these uh, elements, um, you know, certainly kind of add um, a, a, an interesting aesthetic appeal to the game, um, they are uh, keys to engagement. They allow people to have a bit of a change of pace and, and think, well, you know, I, I certainly do want to log in again to this game because there's new things that I can buy, new things that I can do that otherwise weren't there before. Um, and I like to... Um, you know, put, put bonus features in games quite akin to those spontaneous things that happen in, in, in real life. Obviously, in life, we do have our own goals. Um, and, you know, life is, is, is made much more interesting with sometimes when serendipitous things happen, it makes things that much more exciting. So in your surveys, you can still use bonus features to keep things engaging for participants. You can even guise um, a, 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 a level, um, you know, with, with certain research objectives, um, being talked about you can guise that as a bonus feature in in many ways as well and games also have an increase in problem solution methodology and what do i mean by that um well i'm sure all of you listening must have heard or at least played um super mario or games like sonic the hedgehog at, at some point in your lifetimes um you know that when you started playing level one was super easy if anything more of an introduction to help you gain some confidence in the controls and what you need to do um, and slowly and surely um, as you go through the game your skills your confidence your experiences increase so that you can overcome the bigger badder bowsers and other enemies so you can also utilize those small increases in problem solution methods in your research games or gamified surveys as well and i know that i often do that um, for example there might be some studies that i have where some questions that are perhaps more taboo or sensitive in nature are left a little bit later towards the end of the research game than having that right at the beginning it gives participants uh, some time to really kind of get into the the zone of playing the research game feel comfortable you know Obviously, as the game designer, you try to develop a sense of trust between you and the participant by being transparent with them. And so by the time you do maybe come to more sensitive or taboo subjects, you can leave it at the end and participants are feeling much more comfortable to answer those. Um, now, even though games are not about aesthetics, um, something that is key to engagement with online games and console games is a noticeable aesthetic. Um, and that just helps you really, you know, perhaps hear a piece of music or see a graphic um, that reminds you of that game 
and makes you maybe want to kind of log in and play again and, and that leads to lots of feeling of nostalgia so for example when you know, I miss games that I used to play as a teenager, like Boggerman by Interplay, um, and that had a very distinguished and noticeable aesthetic. Um, and there's lots of games re emerging like that now, especially in the App Store. Um, games like Monument Valley, um, games like Duet by Comobius. Um, I recommend you have a look at these really great games, very simplistic, but the, uh, the look and feel um, is very engaging in itself. Um, and finally, but also very importantly, is narrative. Um, more and more game designers are realising that story is hugely important in games, and not just the story that ties in the entirety of the game as well, so in terms of what it is that you have to do and why, but the story of all the characters as well. Um, you know, games like Max Payne, games like World of Warcraft, we're seeing much, much more um, you know, psychological factors in characters. They're, they're, they're much more human. They're much more 360. They've all got their problems. They've all got their issues. They've all got their quirks. Um, and you know, it's not that uncommon for for me to um, you know engage in a conversation with my fiance, for example, who's been playing Grand Theft Auto, and talk about the character of Trevor, for instance, because he's got his own. Thing going on as well. So, so narrative is hugely important and you can use narrative as a way to uphold the research objectives in your gamified survey or your research game. You can very much develop a narrative that ties into the kind of details that your client wants to know about and I'll be giving you some examples a bit about uh, that later. So that's that's what, what makes a game a game, so th those game mechanics are definitely what makes a game a game. But what is gamification? Um, so essentially gamification is, um, is a way of using game mechanics and applying those to anything that isn't a game. Um, and there's tons and tons of examples of gamification around the world. But I'd first like to direct you um, to a Wikipedia article about gamification, which um, it doesn't exist anymore, actually. The gamification Wikipedia article has completely changed. So I'm really quite glad that I saved a screenshot of this. Um, and the reason that I did is because I find this bit particularly interesting. So we see here in the article explaining gamification that the technique can encourage people to perform chores that they ordinarily consider boring, such as completing surveys, shopping, or reading websites. Um, and I found this quite funny, but sad at the same time that completing surveys, you know, the product of our industry, has been used as an example of a boring thing to do in the gamification article on Wikipedia. Um, and that was around the time that I was developing research games um, back in 2010 and 2011. And so I definitely thought, well, you know, c clearly I'm onto something here. Clearly, um, you know, gamification needs to be used in surveys because this is how people are perceiving surveys as a boring thing to do. And, and that's not very fair because actually in, in our industry, in the market research industry, there are incredible companies doing wonderful things with data collection and, and other ways of, of uh, surveying participants. Um, so some examples of gamification, literally this is just a tiny, tiny fraction of, of gamification examples that exist in the whole world. Um, obviously, if you just type in hashtag gamification on Twitter, you will get some kind of case study article blog every single second um you know uh, you know gamification has you know since 2010 when the first was the word was first searched on google has really seen um you know quite a steady climb in in popularity so you know anything can be gamified really so losing weight can be gamified you know weight watchers definitely uses rules feedback systems and goals and has a voluntary approach um, you know, you can gamify job interviews. Um, so the apprentice we have over here in the UK with Sarah and Sugar, obviously in the States it's with Donald Trump, is the gamification of the longest job interview in the world, probably. Um, and you can also gamify just people being in a house, like Big Brother, people being in a house where bonus features are things like ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends coming into the house unexpectedly or other bonus features like new activities to do that nobody expected. And of course, there's definitely a goal, there's definitely rules, there's definitely feedback systems. But gamification is also in our everyday lives in terms of things that we buy. So you've got lots of loyalty cards now that again, 
are using bonus features. Um, in the UK, we have a huge um, store called Boots, and they will have those bonus features or they're advertised on, on TV to say that this weekend they're doing triple points on, on certain branded goods and things like that. And you can earn points on um, you know, things that you purchase at airports, uh, the diesel, the fuel that you'll put in your vehicle, for ex example, and buying coffee as well. So you know, when you're buying coffee, you get a stamp to say that you've bought that coffee. It might be that you get your 10th or 15th one free. Um, and of course, McDonald's have been using gamification since 1985, obviously before the word gamification was even invented. And you can see here on the, uh, the right side of the screen that uh, their Monopoly board, uh, which is now completely digital, used to be that it was this piece of paper on a tray that you would, uh, that you would have with your food and that you could take off the stickers off your food products and put it on this board. Um, and the, the interesting thing about these examples of gamification is that there's a very fine line between, well, what actually, what is game and what is gamification? Where does gamification end and where does a game begin? Um, I did a, um, a guest lecture with some game, masters, uh, game theory master students at Brunel University here in London um, only a couple of months ago now. And these are people who have obviously been you know, designing and studying games for a huge amount of time. And I would shout out, you know, tell me what you think this is, um, a game or gamification, I would shout out Weight Watchers, The Apprentice, and there was sort of confusion in the room. People would say game for one thing, but say gamification for another. And it seems to me that whether you're playing a game or taking part in something that's gamified, it's, it's a very objective thing for the player. If they feel that they are taking part in a game, they will often refer to it as playing or having fun or as an experience. But something that isn't quite a game that's more of a game, gamified activity, people said that they took part in something like that. Because I think we all know what it feels like to play and what it feels like to have fun. Sometimes you don't really get that with gamification. I think that's why in market research, there's so much more research and development being done in how to stop gamification feeling um, you know, a, a, a bit like, you know, the kind of pointification, just random points for points sake, and moving on to giving participants a really engaging experience that they can value and know that they've uh, been able to contribute um, in, in a fashion that's really helping people. Um, so, so thirdly, what is a survey tangent? functions before, sliders, um, you know, emoticons, like buttons, things like that that people are quite familiar with, using colours and imagery, um, and toying with question language. Um, and that's quite an interesting one, um, because there's been so many studies that have um, been using gamification, and actually a lot of their uh, gamification is focused in the way the question is asked. And that in itself can increase engagement. However, toying with question language alone without any game mechanics obviously isn't a game and isn't gamification, but it still very much has its place in the market research industry. Um, and so the second level of understanding is, is, to, um, is to differentiate between a game and gamification. Um, now, when I've spoken to people in the games industry, um, it seems that they really hate the word gamification. They feel very passionate about that. Um, you know, uh, it's often thought that, well, you know, if they're just the industry copying games, why do they even need a different name? Um, and then you've got people in gamification who um, perhaps don't really understand why, you know, the term gamification has such negative connotations um, because there's so many people in gamification who really do strive to use the power of game mechanics for social good, for example. But for me, the main differences between gamification and a game is the difference between the use of narrative and the feelings of fun. Um, so I've played lots of games that have a strong storyline, whereas gamified platforms don't tend to have any kind of, uh, you know, characterization or story running through. And again, it's about how you feel. Do you feel that you're playing a game? Do you feel like you're having fun? Um, and so the third thing to understand 
understanding uh, how to make a gamified survey is to let go of the common misconceptions that people have uh, when using games and gamification. And I've heard lots of misconceptions over the past three or four years, um, some of which I'm writing about in my book. And I know uh, Gina was kind enough to um, publish a chapter of my book um, only the other day. So I'm just going to run through the top three misconceptions with you all and give you some examples of uh, why these things aren't true. Um, so for example, I hear a lot of people say, well, games and gamification is just about, you know, having bright colours in a survey or, um, uh, you know, and, and that's the, the key to engagement. But games and gamification are really not about bright colours and there's hundreds of games and gamification platforms that I could show you um, to, to prove that point and I've just got a few here. So, um, you know, award-winning games on the App Store like Limbo, for example, by Playdead. Um, you can see that uh, with the hotel um, graphic in the background there on the right side of the screen. Um, you know, a completely black, white and grey game, uh, actually with very little music and sound effects in the background as well but still an extremely engaging game, multiple award winning. And uh, last time I checked, there were only 12 people at that company. So 12 people have been able to make a game like this. And that should instill a huge amount of confidence in market research agencies that literally have, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of people. Um, there's also games, some that I mentioned earlier, there's a game by, uh, uh, called Duet by Comobius. Again, you know, very min minimalistic in its look no real bright colours there and you've got you know games like Call of Duty, one of the biggest uh, most successful game franchises of all time and again it's not about bright colours, um, it's about you know using game mechanics and, and great gameplay in, in a fantastic fashion. Um, and then you've got um, you know game slash gamification platforms like Urgent Evoke um, which was created by um, a, a game, developer, game developer sorry, called Jay McGonigal who has written a book called Reality is Broken, uh, a best-selling book. Um, and, and this uh, Urgent Evoke platform, uh, again, uses you know, rules, feedback systems, a voluntary approach, um, and you know, uh, components like you know, an ability to share achievement. And it's um, using game mechanics to help people like you and I you know, log into this platform and try and solve real-world issues. So there's lots of examples of, of, of games that don't have bright colours to debunk that misconception that, you know, games and gamification is about bright colours. It really isn't. So I hope that I've um, scrapped, that, um, scrapped that erroneous view there. Um, and the second thing I often hear about um, is that games for research and gamification for research is, is just for kids, and it absolutely is not. Um, I just want to share a very quick example with you um, about a game that um, me, my team and I had developed last year called Tess Undercover Agents, um, which was um, released to um, uh, over a thousand people in the UK, which was for 18 to 65 plus year olds. And we really did get 65 plus year olds playing this research game. Um, and the kind of feedback that we had from these um, older participants was really, really um, fantastic and, and certainly instilled so much confidence in me about the, um, the about, about the place that research games have in the lives of all participants, no matter their age. Um, and one of my favourite quotations um, uh, uh, from one of these participants in their feedback is the top one here from this uh, male age 72. And he said back to us that he enjoyed playing this game very much. He admits that he's not a gamer and neither does he use smartphone or phone apps, but he learned from this gaming experience. And the reason that I absolutely love this quotation so much is not just about the guy's age, but about the fact that he's not once referred to that platform as a survey. He's not referred to it as a piece of research. He's referred to it as a game. He said that he was playing a game. He referred to it as an experience that he learned from. All of these key words, which is wonderful, but within that quote, he's also admitting that he's not very tech savvy. And that debunks yet another misconception that I always hear about, that where people think, well, you know, if you're going to be sending out a game to participants and they're not used to a game, does that mean that they won't be able to take part because they're not tech savvy? But obviously, in your gamification and game design, you will inevitably design something that is going to be suitable for your audience. It is going to be easy to access. It has to be. Um, 
and you know other technical things like you know making sure that it's going to be accessible on all browsers and on as many you know mobile and tablet devices as possible as well and you can see some other quotations here as well people saying that it's enjoyable another person referring to it as an experience someone else referring to it as a mission a mission um, so you know people of, of you know older ages are clearly really enjoying this me methodology as well um, and it's probably worth noting that our oldest place respondent who took part in that game was 89 years of age which was really really amazing because the clients that I was working with um, who are a group of academics trained statisticians have done lots of academic research before they didn't expect that we would get um, people of, of these age groups um, taking part in the survey but we did um, which was obviously really useful for their for the data and their analysis but in the traditional games industry the average age of the most frequent game purchaser is 35 the average game player is 30 and it's no longer um, you know a predominantly male market anymore in fact um, uh, I was reading some statistics only a few weeks ago but it's almost a 50 50 gender split now in people who purchase and play video games um, and another interesting statistic is that the average social gamer so uh, lots of you know Facebook games for example is a 43 year old woman so um, I think that tells us very clearly that games are not for you know teenage boys playing on their consoles in their bedrooms anymore but the games industry's audience has opened up massively um, you know it's not unusual to see a two or three year old playing a game on a tablet device similarly it's not unusual to hear about games consoles like the Nintendo Wii being used in retirement homes or to help um, people um, you know um, use their limbs and their joints who have just had a stroke for example so all age groups are enjoying games and can enjoy games by surveys and research games and the third um, myth that I would like to debunk is that games are about fancy graphics and they're really really not um, in fact, there's a lot of very crudely designed indie games that I have played, which just have a wonderful, you know, user flow, game flow, and they're fantastic to play, even though the graphics, um, you know, might be, you know, um, very, very basic in many ways. Um, and there's an example, this is an example um, of a game that I just absolutely love to show researchers. This, what you're seeing here, the white text on the black background, is a game despite that it's just text on a screen um, this is um, a screenshot from a game from the Zork series this was actually developed in the 1970s and um, so great was the game designed that actually um, game developers and um, fans have taken time to reprogram this game so that it's suitable for modern programming languages devices and browsers um, and you can see here that a narrative is also being used if you just um, take a moment to read what's going on here and obviously it is interactive you participate by um, writing back into the game about things that you're doing for example opening a mailbox or walking to the left or right um, and this doesn't really look that different from traditional surveys if you think about the kind of surveys that um, you often see you know text on a screen um, sometimes they are quite basic um, they're not that far off from what people were doing with the Zork series back in the 1970s. So whenever researchers um, feel apprehensive that a game will be a really costly thing to put in place because of the graphical content, um, I like to show them that screenshot from the Zork series and say, well, hey, actually, you can incorporate game mechanics, but you and your developers don't really need to do uh, anything that different to what you're doing already. You can still program text on a screen, but it's just about market researchers the developers within those market research agencies using their imaginations getting a bit playful and creative to perhaps create a narrative and incorporate those game components um so the fourth um way um you need to uh, learn how to design a gamified survey is to harness the power that already exists in the market research industry and read papers so there's lots of um agencies that have approached me to say uh, well you know I feel a bit apprehensive about creating a research game or, or gamified survey um, and you know can you show me any evidence and it's a wonderful thing to be able to share papers and articles back with those prospective clients and say well hey actually yes look at all these other companies and, and, and me 
who have done research on research. And the great thing about that as well isn't that it just, you know, um, obviously, um, you know, increases the chance that a client will work with me, but it just goes to show that this is an ongoing discussion that clearly researchers are interested in because of all the papers and articles and, and obviously webinars that are being produced. But also it, it saves money for other agencies and, and, and brands who are interested in, in using gamification, but actually when they read these papers that have already been publicized, they can say, right, well, okay, clearly, you know, this, this company took this route in comparing um, a gamified survey with another kind of platform. And it might be that, you know, as they're reading these papers, they notice a gap somewhere and then they can take uh, take that on and do some other kind of comparative research which hasn't been done before as opposed to doing the same kind of research on research and essentially perhaps you know making the same mistakes that have already been made so I would encourage you to read those papers if you are interested in exploring these methodologies um, and there are quite a few around um, I've just put four up which I think are perhaps the most interesting and very detailed for people to read um, and there's a couple that um, I have uh, produced myself. So one that I produced very, very recently is um, called Research Games as a Methodology, uh, the Impact of Online Research Games and Game Components Upon Participant Engagement and Future Research Game Participation. So that's a bit of a mouthful. Sorry about that. Um, and I literally um, had that published through the Association of Survey Computing a, a, a few weeks ago. And that is the first paper that has been produced in going into a huge amount of detail about a, a research game as opposed to a gamified survey. And really talking in depth about the design and why the design, why the narrative, why the game components like music and avatars were used, how they related to the research objectives and similarly what the results of that study were, which um, do bode very well for research games. The, the results were really quite astounding. Um, you know, over 90% of the participants enjoying the game, 81% recall rate, really, really great. Um, and some other studies, um, How Far Is Too Far by Bernie Malinoff and John Paulston. I thoroughly recommend that one as well. Um, again, that shows some really great results that favor gamif gamified surveys. Um, and there's a, a graph that I'd like to share with you in a moment uh, from that study. Um, and John Paulston has also been involved in other papers as well, one of which is called the Game Experiments that he's um, that he carried out with Deborah Sleep. Um, and that's researching how gaming techniques can be used to improve the quality of feedback from online research. Um, and finally, in East 4 um, is a co-written paper by, um, by my clients, actually, Dr. Georgina Turner and Professor Lisbeth Van Zunen, who were my clients on uh, two research games that have been used as a case study in that paper I mentioned earlier and in Tessa Undercover Agents, the game I mentioned earlier that had um, uh, lots of people age 65 plus play. Um, and so the interesting thing about these papers isn't, isn't just that they're showing that gamification and research games, um, you know, show an increased engagement. Actually, uh, the way they're written is very honest and um, talking about the obstacles and, and downfalls faced as well as the positive outcomes. Um, but also the amount of detail that has gone into talking about the design, which is so incredibly important. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of people that, um, that you know, uh, come to me in my workshop groups, lots of researchers who say to me, well, I'm not very creative. So I've come to your workshop to learn about how to be creative. Um, and the interesting thing is that by the end of these workshops, all these researchers have created gamified surveys. So it's not necessarily about being creative, but about obviously knowing what it is that you need to do, putting that in place. And obviously the more time goes on and you, you, you experiment with gamified surveys, the, mu the more confident you will be in creating a narrative that relates to the research objectives and incorporating you know, music and sound effects, for examples, if you're feeling a bit more brave. So these papers really go into design. Um, and so a screenshot I wanted to share with you from Bernie Malinoff and John Paulston's study is, is, is this right here. Now, their data set is massive and John and Bernie are very, very open about uh, sharing their data. Um, and, and they were with me, obviously. So, so thank you, Bernie. And thank you, John. And this is just about to show um, how game based research, their gamified survey fared in comparison to a flash based 
uh, online survey and a standard sort of more traditional online survey. Um, for any people that might not be necessarily familiar with a flash survey, it's, it's very much in terms of its look and feel a traditional standard survey, but there might be more flash tools being used. Uh, like drag and drop functions, scale sliders, you know, smiley faces going into sad faces to portray emotions and things like that. And as we can see, uh, the, the green here represents the gamified survey version and respondents uh, report that version of the survey to be the most fun. Um, and there was the least straight lining in, in the gamified version. In the games industry, you know, rushing through a game is often um, called speed running, or in research we call that straight lining, where you just zoom through a survey. And that 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 decrease in straight lining obviously correlated to an increase in answer time. So people that took part in the game of side version took the most time to answer the question. So they, that suggests that you know they're taking the time, they're really thinking about what they're saying. Where you know you're looking at these three things: fun, answer time, straight lining is very much the holy grail for market research. However, sometimes you don't want your participants to sit there taking too much time answering questions. And that's where sometimes you can experiment with other mechanics, like the use of visible timers. So giving people 30 seconds, one minute to take part in an activity or even answer a question to ensure that you're getting those top of mind responses and perhaps stop the participants from deliberating. Um, so those four pages papers combined with other research on research and that has been carried out including my own case studies and the commercial work I do with, with brands um, so game-based research so that includes gamified surveys and research games has proven to decrease straight lining um, answer time is longer obviously um, we also find out more about the participants um, I've done some comparative focus groups uh, where I've used gamification in one study and um, gone about the, the focus group in a traditional fashion in the other study. And uh, what I've seen in the offline um, uh, surveys, uh, as well as the online surveys, is that participants are telling us much more about who they are, uh, whether that's through, um, you know, they're making an avatar of themselves or just feeling that they can be more open and honest about themselves, how they dress, their personality, whatever it is that might be. Um, also, quite unexpectedly, um, in my comparative focus groups, participants have stated that they remember more about each other in the gamified focus groups. That was an expected interesting thing that has happened. And um, I theorise that that's because all the participants have been much more engaged in the gamified focus groups and are really listening to each other. So when we're asking them, you know, what do you remember about other people, they can really recall those, um, those uh, you know, other things that people have said in the focus groups, um, sometimes with great clarity. Um, and all of that leads to participants providing data that is much more insightful to the researchers, to the brands. Um, the respondents are saying they enjoy the experience more, as we've seen, uh, you know, in some quotations I've sh shown you just now. Um, also, there's lower dropout rates and higher incidence rates as well. Um, that might be in part due to the fact that people are quite intrigued by the, the novelty of a research game or gamified survey. They might see that email come through and say, oh, wow, you know, I've been invited to do a research game or gamified survey. This is a bit different. So their initial, um, you know, signing on to do the survey, um, it, it, you know, it is more. The incidence rates are increased um, and the dropout rates are, are decreased because they are engaged. They are having a good time. Um, and that all leads to an increased chance of customer loyalty. And, and I've seen this myself. Um, when our participants have taken part in some of our research games, they have completely voluntarily said, please, 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 can you send me more of these? Even given us their email address so we can send them more. Um, you know, they're, they're very vocal about doing, doing more of these studies, which is great. Um, you know, the, if that people feel that, that uh, in, intrigued by research games that they want to do more. Um, and there's also increased client engagement. And that's a really fascinating thing for me because when I worked in market research before I started research again, it was often the case, as I'm sure many of our listeners um, can relate to, that you would get sent a survey and it had to be programmed and, and you know, launched yesterday. Um, however, when, uh, whenever um, uh, I've been working with clients on research games, they've become really engaged with um, with the design of the research game, even becoming co-research game designers, you know, it's not unusual for them to sit with me and say, well, hey, actually, how, how about we shape this activity in level two or three like this? 
because that will relate to this analysis that I need done. So, so they take much more time in their research study and they're more engaged with it and they're more engaged with the gamification of the survey as well, which is really wonderful to see. Um, also, research games and gamified surveys can capture data that traditional research cannot gather. And a great way that that happens is within a game environment, you might have a virtual environment, you might have um, you know, an avatar creator tool, for example. So instead of you asking questions directly, you're actually watching what participants are doing in a scenario, in a situation. And through watching their behavior, you're still gathering data. And that data in turn will still help your client despite the fact that you haven't outright asked the question. Um, so there's many, many ways that you can be very clever, you know, with virtual environments and things like that. Even if your virtual environments aren't 3D, they might just be kind of flat 2D graphics. There's lots of ways that you can give participants an activity to do and gain data based on what they're doing, how long they take to do it as well. Sometimes that's really important too. Um, and also using online um, game-based research methodologies allows... Um, allows you as the researchers to um, simulate an experience that relates to the research objectives and stimulate the participants' memory. Um, so a really great example of this actually is um, um, a client I was talking to not that long ago from an automotive uh, company and um, a research study that they want to do uh, was to um, ask participants basically what they felt uh, needed to be improved in the, in the dashboard of the car. Now obviously if you're taking part as a participant in a traditional survey or being put these questions about what you think is missing from your dashboard in your car obviously it might be quite hard for participants to recall the experience of driving or even just to recall what on earth their dashboard looks like so um you know by using graphics you can take advantage of, of that and and simulate an experience and stimulate a participant's memory by using graphics so you know for example if it's um what would you make for dinner tonight you know you could have a graphic of a kitchen watch what people do, what they take out of the fridge, what kind of ingredients they want to put together for the lasagna that evening. Uh, and and that's, um, that's ways that you can stimulate and simulate um, experiences for participants. Um, and, and finally, um, using games for research, um, I believe, uh, may genuinely be the saviour for our entire industry. I mean, we're already seeing how game-based methods are hugely increasing engagement, especially at a time where, um, as an industry, we were really struggling with response rates um, and dropout rates as well. Um, and part of that is because we are more and more bringing people um, outside of the typical market research confines, outside, you know, we, we might even be going to um, hire people from the games industry as, as we have at Research Through Gaming who can look up what we're doing with fresh eyes and say well actually why don't you do your survey like this um, or it might even be the way we're using storytelling when we're talking about the data back to the clients or the way that we're putting reports together so so more and more we're seeing in the market research industry that outside people are being brought in to make all the things that we're doing much more engaging um, so moving on, so the, the uh, so to number five, um, uh, another thing that you have to do to design a gamified survey is incorporate best practices. And um, what I'm giving you here might look very simplistic, um, but this actually the reason it's so simple is because it's been developed through trial and error over the course of three years. Um, so whenever I talk to a client, before I start storyboarding, before I've even put pen to sketchbook, um, I, of, I often ask the clients, obviously not just what their research objectives are, but how that piece of research might um, relate to a company um, objective. You know, what's going on in the company that is making them release this piece of research? Um, you know, is the company growing in some way? Um, are they looking to speak to employees so that they can do some reshuffling, wherever it might be? Um, I, I often ask in a huge amount of detail for the research objectives. Um, in fact, it's a very rare occasion that I'm given a survey to then gamify. Often it, it, it's born out of just the conversation between me and my client about what it is they want to know, and I go away and put those surveys, uh, well, research games together and build the levels, build the scenarios, build the scenes and activities, whatever it might be. Um, and, and the second thing you have to um, know, obviously, is the age of the audience. Now, obviously, in typical market research, we need to know our demographic, but it's so important in gamified surveys and research games, because if you're designing something 
that interactive um, and and that obviously you know visually um, uh, creative and engaging it's really important to know who you are speaking to um, so for example a research game that I've designed for seven to ten year olds looks and feels very different to a research game I've created for Millennials um, and similarly people um, you know from 18 to 65 plus so it's obviously really important to consider them um, so that you are using the right tone the right language as well as you know um, creating activities that aren't going to be too difficult for young children for example that aren't going to be too easy or too um, babyfied for older age groups as well um, and the C in this mnemonic is for culture um, so once again a game that I will design for um, you know uh, people perhaps living in um, New York City might be different to a research game I design for um, you know people living in suburban areas of India so it's really important to, to find out so much about your audience who they are what kind of lives that they lead and obviously that's not that different to how people in games industry design their games um, you know they often obviously have in mind who is going to be playing their games who's going to want to um, enjoy them and you know how they should market them in terms of how they should price them uh, you know what platforms they should be available on so we need to start thinking like game designers when we're creating gamified surveys for our participants um, and the A uh, is for analysis needs um, now that might seem quite obvious but there's been a huge um, amount of times where a client has told me how they're going to be analysing the data afterwards that has then allowed me in some cases to completely redesign a level in a research game because I'm thinking right okay well if my client is going to use this method of analysis actually if I put the question in a different way to the participants then that makes my clients life a lot easier when they're doing the analysis so understanding the way the analysis is going to happen up front before you start designing might very well shape the way you design your research game or gamified survey um, and finally budget um, which I'm sure is on everybody's minds as they're listening to this um, and, and I've always designed research games to budget. A client will say to me, I've only got £2,000, I've only got £4,000, or in some cases where I'm very lucky, I've only got £25,000. Um, and so it's really important to consider the budget because just as people you know, in the games industry can create games on shoestring, so can market researchers. Um, and I, I like to refer back to that screenshot from the Zork series earlier on today. If you are an agency that's really on a shoestring and you want to experiment with game mechanics, you can still use text on screen and still create an engaging platform, just like we see those gamers still wanting to play that Zork series game 30, 40 years later. Um, and it's also um, very interesting uh, to note that obviously you um, should charge more for a gamified survey or research game because if you can evidence to your client that this other way of taking part in research and designing research is going to increase engagement, that also means it's going to save a lot of time and money as well. Um, a game that we uh, conducted for children um, in our first year actually in 2011 for BBC magazines, um, I was allocated two weeks to gain 500 completes um, of seven to ten year olds taking part in our research game um, and the wonderful thing about that very unexpectedly actually because it was a first study I had no idea that this would happen is that we gained more completes that the client needed in less than half the time that we were allocated so we had two weeks and we got more completes than what we needed in just under seven days so when you can show your client that actually this method helps save time, save money, we're getting better data, respondents are more engaged, that in itself means that they're really thinking about what they're saying and doing within the platform is, is basically, in, in my view, proof enough to justify the, the cost that, that, uh, that you might put to the client. Um, um, obviously, don't you know, charge through the roof to your clients. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I think it's important that as many participants as humanly possible get to take part in more engaging surveys. And obviously, we want to make that accessible. And one of the ways of doing that isn't to um, you, you know, o o overprice these, um, these platforms. Um, and the 
six, um, the sixth thing is to be full and transparent with your participants. Um, and that, that needs no, no more slides there from me. I think that says it all. Um, often um, uh, people will say to me, well, should you tell your participants that you're doing a gamified survey? And the answer is absolutely yes. Tell them that you are using game mechanics. Um, tell them why, you know, that you're doing it, obviously, to make the platform more engaging for them. Um, and, and let them know that up front. Let them know that in the email invitation as well, that they're about to take part in a game-based research method. Um, uh, and it's going to look and feel different to traditional surveys. And finally, learn, read books, read books on gaming, read those papers, experiment and play games. I cannot stress that last point enough. Um, I was doing some consultancy work with a client who came over to visit me from the States and I actually gave her a to-do list which consisted of playing three games. If you're, gonna, if you're going to use game mechanics, you have to play games um, because actually in doing that, you are going to be so inspired by lots of different things that you're feeling and seeing and hearing and reading uh, that you might incorporate in your own gamified surveys and um, so some other things to do is you know go to practical workshops there's plenty about uh, workshops about gamification um, you know create a small team in-house maybe even just with two or three people that you know perhaps are dedicated to experimenting with game mechanics and and that in turn leads to maybe allocating a, a budget to not just game-based research methods but engagement as a whole participant engagement as a whole um, and allocate engagement design personnel again they don't have to be gamification specialists just specialists in designing more engaging surveys and uh, yes play games on mobile laptops and tablet devices um, and so the last thing i want to just leave you with um in my three four years that i've been creating game-based research is that this is a platform that just keeps on giving it, it really just has so many positive outcomes that it really just kind of gives our industry as a whole a kind of you know 360 that you know we're, we're creating games for increased engagement but that increased engagement leads to better data collection they want to come back and do more that benefits other agencies as well so it, it really is just a gift that keeps on giving um, and I won't be surprised in the future if we start seeing some job titles that look like this. Um, you know, we might be seeing this on LinkedIn in the future. So research game narratologists, Google Glass game designers, research game concept artists, virtual environment specialists. Um, these roles are actually things that I tend to do every day as one person, but I'm sure that all these different elements will be allocated to other personnel in the future. So uh, definitely some food for thought there. Um, so that's that's uh, the seven steps to how to design a gamified survey. Thank you very, very much for listening. And um, yeah, I'll pass over back to Gina and John. And thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I've been getting a lot of great, lot of great feedback for this presentation and some questions, which will visit us very shortly. Um, now, very quickly, we're going to have John Johnson show us just some basic things we can do to gamify our surveys. and. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make John the presenter. And I apologize for my audio issues earlier. I dialed in, so hopefully everyone can hear me better now. Um, okay. I will let you know when we can see your screen, John. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will take that as audio confirmation as well. And there we are. Perfect. All right. Oh, Go for perfect. it, John. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone who has joined us today um, live. And if you're um, watching the replay, thank you as well. And Betty, that was awesome information. Most excellent. Um, Gina gave a great little bit about me earlier, so we'll go past that. Um, really, I just want to quickly and briefly talk about um, just some simple ways to get started, okay? Um, Betty is obviously has given us some very valuable data and can be a great resource in really building out a game survey. Before now, I want to kind of go through some simple steps and good ways to ease into the new water. Um, and kind of dip our feet into the ocean and see how cold or warm it is first. You know, some of the simple things, and I think Betty mentioned this too, try rewording your questions. Um, look at the before, and she used the same word I use here, you know, boring pops out a lot. And, uh, those who are taking the survey are ready for something unique. So switch it up a bit and engage your respondents, such as the example um, above. You know, we can see the before, what is your favorite video or computer game? And in the after, we went with, 
if you could only play one video game for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, so obviously, uh, we can see that we get them more engaged. It triggers a different way of thinking. It makes them go a little bit more in depth. Make your surveys more interactive. Okay, custom themes via CSS or HTML modifications can communicate the brand, obviously, but also increase the user experience. In addition to, in addition, please drop the radio buttons and check boxes and try to use some more of the. Uh, uh, unique uh, question types like heat mapping, interactive sliders, star rating, smiley faces, etc. Um, what this is going to do, and what it's done for me personally, I've seen surveys uh, that pay attention to this, and I tend to participate um, to these participate due to these details. <clears throat> One of the things we do to engage our communities that we build, we tend to create interactive quizzes uh, that give us valuable data, but as well the respondents get. Um, a segment and a score information, but an incentive as well. Very engaging. And encourage social media sharing. Turn your one-lane road into a massive highway by using your engaged users' online traffic of friends by offering incentive to share with friends via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google, etc. And today we can give incremental rewards based on points over time or actions performed via respondents within a survey or in a community. Um, creating a community allows the ability to create levels of which respondents only get to the next level based on quality and continued quality data and continued engagement. And I wanted to quickly give you an example in thinking of the long term and so that you can win. Um, instead of just a survey, uh, Sierra Nevada wanted to build um, on a gamified community to, to continuously have an easier way to test new flavors entering the market. And some of the things you want to think about in building a panel or community, this is kind of the building 101. You want to define and build a profile info based on, um, in their case, typical craft beer consumers. Uh, so what information do you want to use, such as uh, gender, income, etc., and deploying out surveys, but also all this information you have uh, handy in the analytics process when you're reviewing your research results. If you have an existing database, such as uh, the Sierra Nevada Beer Camp, that is a good way to start building your community, reaching out and tapping into those users to join the community and participate in the research. <clears throat> um, you want to think of a deployment plan. Um, how many surveys are you going to send out throughout the year? Uh, are these going to be profiling surveys, full-on surveys? Are you going to do some online or in-person discussions? Really, you have a lot of things to play with here. You want to recruit. You want to continue to recruit. You may be able to start with a database, but continue to recruit in some of those ways you can do via social media. Uh, in terms of Sierra Nevada, they can put it on their bottles or coasters, target social, um, uh, certain geographic locations. And then you want to use points and rewards. Sierra Nevada used the iPhone bottle openers to all who signed up uh, for the community, as you can see here in this illustration. And lastly, decide what kind of reports should be generated. Um, do you want to see the data for just the brewers versus consumers? Do you want to see that data all together? It's something to just think about in advance. Now, points and rewards. Certain actions give points, and points lead to rewards. Over 60% of businesses use gift cards for incentivizing. You don't have to run out um, like of the old days and go to the mail carrier to deliver the reward, or have a bunch of cash on hand to hand out payments. Um, plus, you don't have to keep tabs on an inventory. Using, um, uh, use a tool that does all the work for you, that makes it easy to administer, broad coverage and appeal, and cost effective. Another good thing to do is, uh, and add a little gamification element, is badges um, for achievements. Badges are powerful for behavior change and act as a guide to achieving end goals. But it is important to note that when you consider using badges, it's a part of a gamification system and not the entire experience. And make sure you choose something that allows for customization of the badges to fit your brand, to fit your game, to fit your levels, or whatever it is to tie into the overall experience. <clears throat> and one of the things, you want to choose a platform that has a personalized member portals, cross-platform compatibility, 
push notification and delivery, user discussion boards, and these are just some of the engagement modules you want to think about and consider and that we find on the survey analytics platform. Um, many of these items can be used to trigger incremental incentives, but most importantly, it leads to an engaged community, and an engaged community will provide you with valuable data on an ongoing basis. And that was my last little bit. Again, I want it to be brief, but I want to give you some of the quick and really easy steps in getting started when you're starting to look at getting into the waters of gamification or gamified surveys. And I'll pass it over to Gina. Thank you so much for that, John. And I'm going to go ahead and go back to my slide. Just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and quickly just kind of wrap up today and just kind of conclude a lot of the things we've learned today from both Betty and John. Um, just kind of, Betty did a very great high-level overview of just what gamification is and a lot of the education and how it became to be such a hot topic. And so I kind of wanted to show a common example of something we see today and what the future projections of gamification are. You know, something today that's a concern is things like a rewards catalog. Um, some of you may have those at your businesses. The last three places I worked for did that. Um, there's very little personalization involved in that, and it's just a straightforward points-based economy, and there really is a lot of red flags and mixed and questionable success in using that method. And, you know, what Betty offers here is she's kind of moving to gamification 2.0 and into the future, increasing the effectiveness of that, um, doing things like building a community, um, coming up with player types and user personas implementing actual game elements and game play into surveys and then, you know, of course the social collaboration is going to be very big in the future. So I do have a lot of questions that have come up. So if you have any more, feel free to ask them in the questions panel. Um, I'm going to address probably about five of them right now, but if you ask a question, I have taken note and we will get you the answer to your question. So just one moment. Questions panel back up. Okay, so Betty, there. I'm here, Gina. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I actually have quite a few questions for you. I'm going to ask some of the um, first ones that were asked. Um, Chris Perkins has asked if you would touch up on how gamifying a survey affects the data quality. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time, Gina? Sorry, the audio just went a bit funny for me there. Can you touch on how gamifying a survey affects the overall data quality? Um, well, what we've, what we've been able to see, not just um, at Research Through Gaming, but other organisations who have done comparative study, is that um, in terms of the impact on overall data quality, um, the data quality is improved. Um, and whether that's through getting a more representative sample, um, because people that aren't usually interested in doing surveys are now doing the, the surveys because they, they, they feel that they're more interesting now. Um, to the, the amount of uh, time that people are giving to answer each question, um, you know, so they're really thinking about the response. So um, the short answer is in terms of the impact is uh, it's much more positive um, when gamify, gamification or, um, or, or games are being used. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Betty. Um, the next thing, earlier you kind of talked um, a little bit on, about focus groups and whatnot in your presentation, and we had a question if you could provide an example of a gamified focus group, which I thought was a very interesting question. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, well, actually, if you go on the Research for Gaming website, there's a couple of examples of how you can use game mechanics and focus groups there as well that are uh, obviously more, much more detailed um, than what I'll be able to give you right now. Um, but you can certainly, um, you know, uh, use use game mechanics to um, allow participants to perhaps explore their environment, which might be useful in a study based in a supermarket, for example. Um, so often things what, uh, that I've done is, um, you know, hiding questions around the room and, you know, participants will 
be told to go off uh, at one point and collaborate so that they can all take part in finding out where these hidden questions are and then they're discouraged from working in collaboration and then work competitively to find questions um, and what I do with researchers is actually the opposite of that so when I'm talking to researchers and teaching them about games I often hide not questions but facts and figures and things like that so they're exploring their surroundings that they're in but they're also learning as they're going along um, and so, and so there's other the other ways of, of using games, you know, use, using timers again, you know, giving people short bursts of different activities, that's often very useful, um, you know, allowing them time to do things that are quite interactive and creative with other people and then some time alone. Um, but yeah, I really encourage you to go on the RTG website uh, because there's some examples there that you can see too. Okay, great. And then I've also had multiple people ask, um, you know, where they can find some of your design examples. So if you want to chime in and um, answer Yeah, absolutely. That. Um, well, again, on research3gaming.com, there are some game trailers there. So um, just like movie trailers, we make um, trailers for our, some research games that we've made. Um, and there's two that um, are publicly available on my client's website, as well as through um, the Research for Gaming YouTube channel as well. Um, and you can go on and actually play, play those games too. So um, if you go on imprintsfutures.org, um, our two games um, are there. Actually, uh, one of the screenshots from our game is, is on, the, on their home screen. Um, but the easiest way to go about it potentially is go to researchforgaming.com, check out the trailers and um, have a look at the, th at the games there. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Betty and John, for the great presentation today. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this. And um, again, I will be sending a replay and the slides from today out to everyone who signed up for today's webinar. And thank you to everyone that hung on. And I will address all of the questions we didn't get to and have those up on our blog later this afternoon. Thank you so much, Betty. Thank you, John. Thank you. Mm -hmm.